Uh, I just read... Um, I, not really the forum post, per se, in regards to the... Um, what is it? The conversation with Pullycat. But I was reading, I guess there was some of the stuff, it just wasn't really conveyed very well, or, or just felt like it was lacking. So I figured that I would try to take a little more explanation to connect the dots, because I actually had talk, talked about almost all of this stuff in the, uh, in the conversation, but maybe it was disjointed or felt disjointed and just didn't have a connection for some folks. So I'm just going to try to clarify, if only for the fun of doing it. On the player avatar connection, uh, this is something that I wrote in reaction to. Uh, this is a gentleman that would say, hey, I'm at the part where you guys are talking about, you know, where the player is. Uh, he's talking about the hull, you mentioned the planes more so, I'm sure you brought that up. My response, Polycat sees PvP to be an avatar versus avatar. The player is represented via an avatar in the game. He was arguing that the planes are the player, and since the planes can regenerate and take meaningless damage while inflicting meaningful damage, the planes can get hurt but it doesn't matter, but when the ship gets hurt, I mean, that sticks, That's that is permanent. And by that's nature, it's an unbalanced encounter. The real player, the ship in this situation, is fighting a poltergeist, basically. A little ghost phantasm that he can't really interact with, and the only actual interaction is via an automated system that attempts to swat away this ghost entity without ever actually definitively stopping said poltergeist. Because theoretically, you could kill all the planes, and more planes could show up. There's not a, a lasting nature to it. I did not agree. To me, the hull is the player's avatar, which is why I spoke at length about the planes being an ordinance, a guided ordinance, which has very direct control scheme, but still an ordinance. Ultimately, Pullycat felt that the camera residing in an over-the-shoulder view from the planes made it feel like the planes are the avatar for the CV player. And there's other things as well. It's not just feel. There's... There's the feeling of it, there's the camera, there's the consumables, there's a lot of conceptual stuff as to why he feels that the planes are the real avatar for the CV player, and thus the feel of the back and forth interaction is inherently fair, uh, not fair because of the reason spoken of briefly before. My response was that whether you feel or identify with an expendable plane ordinance doesn't mean anything other than there's a human that's deciding to identify with something that they decide to invest connection in. As far as the non-emotional, cold logic of the game is concerned, the CV player is represented by the CV's hull as their avatar. Evidently, this is such a core tenet to both of our worldviews that any further agreements could not be established. Both worldviews are quite literally based on different foundations. I see a cold, emotionless game. Bully Cat sees it as an experience that has investment, that you invest into a thing or the entities in front of you, and the interactions resulting from that investment have overriding importance. So, um, player avatar connection. What is this? Why is this? Etc. Player avatar connection is, it's how the player feels that they are represented in a game. In chess, you are represented in the game by the pieces on the board. But at the same time, you don't necessarily see yourself as each individual piece. As a checkers player, you're represented by the pieces on the board. Uh, in World of Warships, you're represented often by the ship, because that's what you are directly controlling. When it dies, you are dead. So as a player, you see that often in role-playing games, there are avatars that you, again, connect with, things of that nature. But the connection here is problematic in the sense that you can connect with whatever you emotionally feel like you're connecting to. Um, so, one thing you have to remember is for a game design company, they have to, this, this is extremely important, they have to double down on the player avatar connection to make sure that the player is invested in the game. If they don't have this, if they can't grab you, especially very quickly, it's very likely that you can just find another game that will. Uh, kind of similar to a movie where the first 10 minutes really need to grab your attention so that you just don't 
not you just don't zone out and stop caring about the movie so often the movie will have an impactful event that establishes a situation and then from that impactful event it all moves forward but in this game in world of warships where you do have planes that do have consumables and hit points and a variety of other things uh and polycat had argued that you spend probably 90 percent of the time as a cv flying around fucking planes there's a sound department at Wargaming that designed engine noises. There's an art department that designed the planes. There's a coding department that designed it how the camera works and how it follows the rockets and how this other stuff. There's a balancing department that decided how they interact with things, how the AI goes. All, all, of, the, all of the experience has been modeled and created so that you, the player, while guiding the planes and doing this stuff, have a fully a fully enrapturing experience almost like a vr experience where you can you can be in the action and a game designer is trying to design this because that's the best way to grab and retain a player but just because you the person are connecting to an experience that you're having doesn't turn that into an avatar in a sense of a larger game experience um, if you had some kind of, uh, elaborately animated chess game where if your knight took a pawn, that it came out to like a five minute back and forth battle between the knight and the pawn, but ultimately the knight won, you can actually invest so heavily in that that you may identify with it. But in the end of the day, it's just chess and you're controlling chess. It's similar with World of Warships in that you have a physical thing, a physical piece on the board that you are represented by, but the immersive experience is actually designed in intentionally, and I can understand how that might be confusing, but to just step back and look at it purely logically, that is what it is. That's why I argue that the hull is the piece and the planes are the ordnance. Moving on, emotional reaction. Intended, expected. We covered this in the conversation, or I brought up, when basically I talked about intentionally investing misery. Was I trying to say that games are trying to make you miserable? No. What I'm trying to say is that having an emotional reaction leads in to the player avatar connection. When you have some kind of connection, for instance, if you play Alien Isolation, where you're creeping around a ship because there's an alien somewhere. If there's no... If the game developer doesn't use all the tricks, the sound, the lighting, the scene, the setting, um, doesn't invest so much that it can pull this emotional connection out of you, then you don't have it. And the lack of that connection can be such a, such a barrier for people that it often results in them not investing in it. We could, I'm sure you could find 50, 100, 1,000 different games where you're supposed to be afraid of the alien, but the alien looks cartoonish, or the alien just doesn't seem scary, or frankly, you just don't care enough about the game to even care enough to be scared, which is a sign of not necessarily bad game design, but a bad uh, environment, a bad experience. Emotional reaction, is it intended, expected? You... I, I believe that the mark of the good game design is that they're trying to make you have both good and bad experiences to increase the range of what you have to draw from. So when you do have the cripplingly frustrating experience of running away from a situation that you can't handle in the ship or the class that you're in, when somebody on your team comes over to help you overcome that situation or that oh my god, we're going to lose, but then somehow you overcome and turn it into a win, there's a low low, but a high high. And I do say that that's needed. So just to clarify, am I saying that people need to be miserable? No, but there is, there is an understanding that in order to make sure that there's an experience, just like reading a book or having a movie, there have to be lows and there have to be highs. Emotional reaction, earned, balanced. So reading that post before, in 
In the situation Polycat described, you're in a ship and the enemy player is controlling planes. So if you kind of visually or conceptually think of the person who's controlling the planes is a player and you're trying vainly to hit the O key and they're just going to walk over and hit you. Okay, well maybe you shot down one or even all of their planes. Who cares because they just spawn more and they come back. Is the emotional act, what happens with that reaction? Well, it's frustrating because you did a thing, you tried to do the right thing, and you still got punished or you still had a negative interaction. And that negative interaction lingers and some people get very frustrated with that. They take it personal. It happens even when a surface ship fires at another surface ship. I've been in many groups with a variety of people. They get angry if they smoke and nobody spots for them or if they get shot by an enemy ship as though that's something strange. Still, they have a negative reaction to it. Well, why do I put earned? Because I've heard multiple times that the RTS version of Carriers was effing hard, was really mechanically obnoxiously hard. And because of the amount of mechanical interaction that folks knew, geez, this is really tough, that if you were able to pull something off, that people felt that there's still, <laughs> It may be unpleasant, but at least you can respect the amount of effort that came into it to actually be able to pull it off. For instance, if there was a cross-torping situation in a really clutch game, it might suck that you died to being cross-torped, but you kind of have to admire the two people that set up the cross-torp that resulted in your demise. Because it's earned, you can at least have some kind of sense of, this was bad, but I can understand it which leads to balanced. Is the negative experience something that you can at least identify, this happened, but is, is it okay that it happened? Uh, in some instances, that could be because you respect the skill of the other player. In some instances, it could be that you realize, ooh, I done fucked up. Um, that is something that a game designer has to focus on because you're going to have interact you're going to have emotional reactions you're going to have highs you're going to have lows are these you know is are the situations and circumstances surrounding these proportional is there relevance between uh situation A and outcome A, a or in situation B and outcome B uh that that's something that you have to take into consideration and the reason to say this is if somebody comes around with planes and they get hit and you take, if you're in an Odin and you get bombed by an MVR for half of your health, because you have 52,000 health and you get 26,000 damage in Citadel damage, suddenly that's almost non-repairable. You're just, well, fuck. Does it feel like a balanced interaction? Does it feel like something that even that there's any way possible that this could be something that didn't or that you could even attempt to justify. Is there something there? And in that situation, that's so extreme, I don't know how to do that outside of, uh, and this was something else that I touched on. Ideal, well, no, sorry, we'll get to that in just a moment, but in terms of this balanced earned concept, I did try to mention that when you design a game, it's like being in the Inception universe. You can make buildings float. You can make you can make down up. You can bend reality to your will because the game doesn't exist. You're creating it. It's totally a figment of your imagination. So, for instance, the when somebody detonates in World of Warships, it can be very frustrating. Ah, oh, shit, I didn't equip the flag, but it sucks that I had to equip the flag, and now we're going to lose. But... There was a part in our conversation when I mentioned a game designer doesn't have to, they can literally make it so that the game never has a bad situation or a situation that leaves you frustrated. For instance, if they made it so that when you detonated, you got a free ship. Well, maybe you lost the game, but you got a free ship. Or maybe you earned 50,000 credits. Or you had some kind of bonus that offset the displeasure and actually overcame it to make it into a pleasurable experience. That's something that a game could do. Is it needed? I don't think so. Well, not in any of the experiences that I see, but it's just worth saying that I, that's something 
to be there. For instance, if people really, really despised being attacked by planes, that if you reached a certain amount of plane damage against your hull, that you basically got paid off for it. Uh, bribed. Hey, you're okay with this, right? Moving on. Ideal versus actual experience. There's a portion in the conversation where Pullycat asked me if I was coaching a team versus you were coaching a team and it involved all four classes, who would have the better team? And my response was, I would assume it'd be you because I assume I don't personally have an experience with Pullycat um, as to how he plays in DDs and cruisers and shit other than to see him in the world championship thing for Verizon for a brief period of time. I didn't watch it all. But I can assume that he is more familiar with three of the four classes than I am, while I assume that I'm either on parity or perhaps it's pretentious, but a little more experienced in carrier. So three against one, I assume he has a more rounded experience. So I said that. I assume he would. Which led to the next thing stating, if I know more than you and you're talking from a game design perspective what if the people that do this basically professionally or they live it do they know more than wargaming and i knew the answer to this and the extent that there are people there are designers that play league of legends that are silver uh silver in terms of rank they're not grandmaster they're not professional level they're silver they don't play the game well but they still do the game design because they understand what they're intending to do which is where the ideal versus actual experience, I was trying to make this point and I don't think it quite came through, which is, is it valuable to have somebody who's extremely informs opinion? Yes, it is. For instance, uh, uh, professional players in League of Legends are probably extremely aware of the highs and the lows relating to a certain carrier, or sorry, character, and how that champion or character interacts with another one. That's very valuable data. If it's not data that they have in a computer, it's data that they get from a person. That's extremely valuable. The, the moral, not maybe not the moral, but the dilemma comes in is that if one player or a hundred players, or even a thousand players, all of which that are incredibly intelligent and have picked apart all of this, goes to the game company and says, this is wrong, these are the correct numbers you should use. Should that game company do it? The answer is that the thought that they should is a fallacy. It's an assumed connection. It's not a real one. The game company is offering you the experience that they made. So ideal versus actual. The actual experience that they make may not be the best that it could be, but it doesn't mean that that's not the experience that they want to offer. And to have somebody that's able to solve it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a better choice in terms of what the actual provider of the experience wants to provide. Uh, an analogy to this could be somebody that uh, is a parenting coach trying to tell a parent that the correct way to discipline a child is X. They may be researched and learned in this topic, but the parent's interaction with the child, ultimately, the parent is a person that's going to make their decisions and the child's going to end up dealing with it. And while there might be a scientifically correct or, or whatever thing, if they have a way that works, that's not damaging to the child, that's not overly uh, 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 a devastating experience that results in just bad, then the parent still gets to make that choice. And similarly, the actual designers looking at the actual game, whether those numbers People don't agree with them. Really intelligent people don't agree with them. It's not the prerogative of the designers to bow to the intellect and the will of very intelligent people. It's the prerogative of the designers to realize what the hell they're doing, take the information from those intelligent people and figure out, are we okay with this? Do we want to keep it as it is? So that's the clarification.